The scariest part about learning photography beyond a foam camera is, in my opinion, lenses. Camera bodies don't always come with kit lenses, especially if you're buying used. And it can be really hard to figure out what exactly you need when you're first starting out. There's primes, there's zooms, anamorphics, macros, but I don't want to overwhelm you. I just want to help you. So let's talk about focal length. Every lens has a focal length. You might have heard someone talking about them like, oh, I have a 35 millimeter, oh, I have a 16 millimeter, oh, I have a 200 millimeter. All of these things are just referring to the focal length of the lens. The simplest explanation I have is that a higher focal length will result in more magnification and less field of vision. A higher focal length lens will almost squish objects in your image together, as opposed to a lens with a lower focal length, which almost expands them. This is why lenses with a lower focal length are referred to as wides or super wide angle lenses. This also results in fisheye lenses at the very lowest level of focal lengths. Like for example, your six millimeters, your eight millimeters and so on. You often see fisheye lenses on action cameras and maybe vlogging cameras, just so you can capture every single thing that's going on without having to, you know, keep posing the camera. They're very versatile. I know a couple street photographers and they mainly stick with 24 to 28 millimeters in terms of focal length because it lets you capture stuff that's sort of happening to you and around you, but it's still focused enough that you're not kind of capturing the entire street, for example. It's a nice sweet spot. Wildlife photographers generally want magnification at the expense of field of view. So you're gonna see 200 millimeter, 300 millimeter, even maybe 400 millimeter lenses on those guys. I love shooting street photography with this 50 millimeter lens. I know it's a lot tighter than I think people recommend for street photography, but that's in my mind what's so appealing to me. Streets are really, really hectic, especially in like bigger cities and being able to zoom in on one specific thing that's happening while not being so zoomed in that you can't even notice anything else, it's nice. It's really, really nice. Wide angle lenses can absolutely work in nature context, wildlife context, and specifically landscape context because you can capture those beautiful vistas. Now the other half of the equation here is aperture. Aperture is basically how much light the lens lets into the sensor. You can actually see it right here if I can catch this right, but this is a pretty dramatic example of the lens physically closing that aperture hole as I close it and open it, which is really cool. This affects stuff like low light performance and depth of field. Low light performance is pretty self-explanatory. You're basically just letting in more light to the sensor, which allows you to use less artificial compensation or you know slower shutter speed, stuff like that. It gives you a lot more freedom at night. Depth of field is a little more tricky, so let me explain. Okay, let's imagine that I am this penguin right here. Good. I am trying to take a picture of this little dolphin. This guy's right here. I'm trying to focus. Let's imagine that my focus point is right here, right in this line. So I'm focused on everything here in between point A and point B. Let's say my aperture is 1.2. The lower the number for aperture, the more light you're letting. So my aperture is incredibly low, I'm at 1.2. This is crazy wide open. Everything is great right now, but let's say I wanna capture something behind it, like this giant camera right here. Well, I need to close down my aperture to let's say 5.6, and that makes my depth of field a lot deeper, less shallow. There we go. That's all this is. All you're doing is effectively making the area of what is in focus bigger or smaller with that depth of field, with that aperture. This is how you get that beautiful bokeh effect and actually what your camera on your phone is trying to simulate whenever you use something like a portrait mode or something like that. So now you're probably thinking, how do zooms fit into this whole thing with focal lengths? Here I have an 18 millimeter lens and now it's a 55 millimeter lens. It's just that simple. All you're doing with the zoom is just changing the focal length, making it larger or smaller. This lens here actually has really convenient markings of where common focal lengths you want are. So for example, I can go from 18, 24, 28, 35, all the way to 55. You can stop anywhere in between those. It's really just up to you, but, but it's really convenient to have that marking because sometimes you wanna shoot with a 35 or a 24, or an 18. It's convenient. The prime lens here, by comparison, cannot zoom, 
There is no change in the focal length. It is locked at 50 millimeters. Now you're probably thinking, what's the point of getting primes if zooms can just pretend to be primes whenever they want, right? That's a very valid question. I like primes more, and here's why. Primes are generally a little bit cheaper than zooms. Now, obviously, there's the value proposition of zooms being able to simulate all those different focal lengths, but there are some trade-offs here. There's a lot of moving parts in a zoom lens, and that introduces a lot of complexity. You basically have to maintain a level of optical consistency across all of those different ranges. As a result, there are some trade-offs when it comes to aperture, for instance. This is the kit lens that came with my Sony NEX camera right here. It's great. It has a variable minimum aperture. And what that means is if you look at the body, it says 3.5 to 5.6 by 18 to 55. And what that means is at 18 millimeters, which is the most zoomed out focal length they can do, the minimum aperture is 3.5. You can always go up. You just can't go lower than 3.5. Now, if you zoom in, that minimum focal length actually goes up and up and up until it hits 5.6 at 55 millimeters. Now, if you want a zoom lens that actually has a constant aperture, regardless of the focal length, that obviously costs a little bit more money. And higher end lenses definitely have that feature. But at the entry level range, you might notice this more and more. I think that this is exaggerated because people associate that beautiful, trendy depth of field with lower aperture and to be fair yes they're related they're absolutely related but there's also a lot of other factors you can do to sort of achieve that beautiful creamy bokeh look if you wanted to aperture is not the only thing that determines depth of field here's a tip if you want shallow depth of field and you have a kit lens that can zoom that doesn't have particularly low aperture all you got to do is zoom and back up that's all you got to do just keep zooming keep backing up and you'll see results I really prefer the simplicity that a prime offers me. Having a single focal length is really fun in my opinion because I actually have to physically move. I can't just zoom and adjust the framing based on that. I have to physically set up the shot. I can't just get lazy and not frame correctly and sort of rely on a zoom as a crutch. I have to physically get up and go do it myself. And that is a good thing. That is a good, trust me, that's a good thing, okay? It will absolutely make you a better photographer to stick to a prime lens for a little while. You think less about working the camera to get the shot and more about working the scene, your environment, and the subject. Recommending a lens and a focal length to beginners is really tricky. We're all shooting different things. A landscape photographer is gonna have different requirements than a street photographer, and so on, and so on, and so on. But I'll do my best. If your camera has a kit lens, absolutely use it. There's nothing wrong with using your kit lens and most kit lenses nowadays are actually pretty impressive. So don't feel shamed, just stick with it, use it, experiment, you'll do great. If you want to buy another lens after that or you need another one and you don't want to zoom, absolutely go with the Prime. I think Primes are so essential. And I would go with specifically a 35 to a 50 millimeter prime. There's a couple reasons for that. It trains you to subconsciously look for impressive shots, fun shots, stuff you want to shoot just subconsciously when you're outside, which is so fun. And also horrible when you don't bring your camera everywhere. There's also a lot of competition in the space, which means that you can pick up a pretty cheap, decent lens with usually pretty low f-stop as well for cheap. And that's great for beginner photographers who maybe aren't trying to be a professional or don't have a lot of budget to work with. The third reason is they're great for portraits and your friends and family are gonna love you if you take their pictures. I actually recommend going a little bit wider after that. It will really test your composition skills when you have to kind of manage every single thing in front of you, but it absolutely makes you a better photographer and you can capture so much more. You're almost inside the scene yourself when you're shooting at super wide. Oh man, it's been it's been tricky focusing on this script in this video, man. Like it's if only there was a way to like automatically focus. Automatically focus. Autofocus is generally not present on that cheapest tier of lenses. And that's okay. I honestly think that autofocus is a little bit overrated in a lot of contexts. If you're shooting mainly static subjects, if you're on like a photo walk, you don't really need autofocus. 
A lot of cameras nowadays also have really good focus assist tools. I was shooting for pretty much like, I want to say six months primarily with this lens, which is a manual lens on this camera with no viewfinder. I'm basically walking around doing this and just focusing like that. And it worked out perfectly. Your camera's autofocus will mess up eventually, but knowing that you can pick up the slack is almost more useful. The cost saved by going manual can also, you know, save you a buck too. You can sometimes get something like this lens, for instance, which has a crazy low f-stop. This is a 1.2 f-stop lens. It's not particularly sharp at the edges, and you will notice this in cheaper lenses. It's not going to be sharp uniformly throughout the image. Your edges are going to be a little bit more blurry, but it was cheap. It works good. I don't care. Once you're comfortable with manually focusing, you can also look into vintage lenses, which are also really, really good. They're often extremely cheap because people are just throwing them in thrift stores. And a good lens doesn't just stop being good. All you need is maybe an adapter to put it on your new camera. And that's pretty much it. If you enjoyed this video, thank you so much for watching. Um, it means a lot to my penguin and me. Uh, leave a like if you enjoyed it. If you didn't like it, please give me a comment. Tell me what you want me to do more of. Uh, my next video is going to be on something a little bit more retro. Uh, we're going to see if I can even get it working. So that'll be fun. Um, thank you so much again. And uh, subscribe if you want to see more. I try to do this weekly. I've been pretty good about that so far. So yeah, that's good. And uh, yeah. Yeah.